Great. I am really excited to introduce our next speaker, um, Gabriel Diaz Montemayor. Um, he, Gabriel is an assistant professor of landscape architecture at the University of Texas at Austin, where he's led several collaborative design studios working with public institutions and students on real projects in Mexico and the U.S. Gabriel is also a founding partner of Labor Studio, which stands for Landscape Architecture Border, based in Chihuahua, Mexico. His research and practice focus on public space as a social and environmental integrator along the U.S.-Mexico border region. So please welcome me, or don't welcome me, join me in welcoming Gabrielle. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, is this on? Is, this, is it working? Hello? Yes? yes? Okay. Thank you uh, very much, uh, uh, particularly to the or organization of HOPES. Uh, we have been in touch for our, a few months, and I think it's fantastically organized, so congratulations. Um, okay, so my presentation uh, is uh, going to be uh, fairly uh, wide and uh, I think uh, ambitious to what you're going to see, um, particularly with the uh, uh, idea of dissemination of landscape architecture in the Americas, which is very uneven and, uh, and uh, really is particularly uh, in a different position in uh, Latin America or all of the uh, rest of the continent south of Rio Grande, Rio Bravo, um, uh, if, if we compare North American countries, Canada and the United States and the rest of, of the continent. So, I will try to uh, explain a number of projects which I've done uh, both in my teaching and in my practice and uh, some uh, uh, projects that I have been researching to identify, uh, for lack of a better term, how to, how to get away with it, right? how to implement uh, landscape architectural projects which are in dire need in pretty much everywhere, but particularly in, in the Americas and more particularly in Latin America. And, uh, and in this context, I think it's important as well to comment that I won't really uh, concentrate on uh, definitions for the idea of hybridization. Uh, I, I'll just point at the simple uh, concept of uh, discovery of new typologies and finding w new ways of practice, new project typologies that are specific to local conditions and have to be created to, in response to local conditions in order to be implemented. Um, when I speak about people, I, to me it's just a, as commented as well in, my intro, in the intro, gracious introduction done to this presentation, I am convinced uh, on, in the paradigm of the social and env environmental uh, capacity uh, of landscape uh, of putting together putting us back together, uh, not just between us, but also uh, reconciling natural systems uh, with uh, urban systems, with human systems. So, in, in, in the context of the Americas, I, I will start with a little bit more of a specification of what I mean by, by this, this hybridization, the uh, importance of implementation in a context of a relative uh, absence of uh, disciplinary frameworks for landscape architecture. Um, so uh, there's, there are few books about Latin American landscape architecture or Latin American landscapes around, uh, but probably one of the most important is Latinscapes, uh, uh, written by Jimena Martignoni, an Argentinian uh, theorist and historian who often also writes at, in Landscape Architecture magazine. Um, so, Probably the most important takeaway from the book, in my opinion, is how landscape architecture in Latin America is, is an attitude. It's not a discipline, because there are very few uh, educational programs in all of, of the continent, right? Um, it, it's not a profession, because there, is, there are no regulatory frameworks that demand, uh, for this kind of project, you need a landscape architect, right? It's more about uh, diversity of, uh, she even speaks about the word hero, right? Diversity of uh, attitudes and heroic impulses to uh, be able to implement projects uh, which have to do with 
landscape architectural matters, methods. Um, so in this context, uh, how, how to identify how other people have been able to get away and implement landscape architectural projects in the region. I have been particularly interested on the idea of design research, which is, uh, the, let's say, the most conventional way of thinking about uh, academic, an academic approach to research, um, which is based on design, design uh, based on projects. A very interesting thing about the idea of design research in Latin America is that mo in most cases it's not known uh, in its literal translation to Spanish or Portuguese, for that matter, uh, which would be uh, investigación de diseño, right? Uh, but the most common um, uh, translation in Latin American landscape practice is project research, right? Uh, so the project, not, not the idea of design, but the project is the one that produces knowledge. And I believe it's uh, probably uh, related to the fact that uh, also in the rest of the uh, continent, um, uh, the, the drivers of the disciplines are mostly uh, also coming from practice, right? Uh, in Latin America, there are much fewer full-time academics, right, teaching full-time in, in, in universities, right? Uh, in Latin America, uh, most uh, professors uh, double up with uh, practice, uh, mostly because of very low uh, wages when you are engaged in teaching. So you have to do practice, you have to do teaching, uh, which in a way, it's sort of also sort of a heroic uh, activity, right? It, sometimes it's just space for gas, literally, right? Um, so the, the, uh, the prominence of practice in, uh, in the teaching, in the education of architecture, urban design, landscape architecture, urban planning in Latin America might be one possibility, and this is just a, a hypothesis, uh, which determines that the idea of the project is more important than the idea of design, right? Although it might seem to be the same thing. Um, so I have been looking at a number of uh, uh, project case studies, uh, uh, traveling in, in Latin America, researching in Latin America to identify um, how to get away with it, right? And uh, probably one of the most important projects, recent projects is the Rio Medellin project in Medellin, Colombia. Uh, Colombia has been uh, for a number of years, uh, particularly after the uh, renovation of the Colombian institution in the early 90s has been a model for, uh, not just for Latin America, but for uh, uh, our planet regarding uh, an interest on uh, a social kind of urbanism, uh, public space, um, and also, uh, importantly, a very efficient system of uh, uh, design competitions to decide and to uh, select the best projects to implement uh, public architecture and sometimes, oftentimes, private architecture, open and private open spaces, and even planning. So in Medellin, um, a few years ago, uh, the city was calling for a project to recover the structural role of the Medellin River. They opened up a competition. Uh, there were a number of submissions from all over the, uh, the world, and eventually, uh, the uh, a couple of the finalists are uh, uh, two projects that I'm going to use to try to sort of introduce the idea of uh, hybridization uh, for implementation. One project is this one uh, by uh, the uh, Laboratory Arquitectura y Paisaje, which literally means uh, Architecture and Landscape Laboratory. Um, they produce, uh, have been producing fantastic graphic uh, products since a while ago. This was the former office of Luis Callejas. Maybe you have heard of Luis Callejas, um, uh, who eventually, when they were together, they were called Paisajes Emergentes, Emergent Landscapes. And, and now Luis Callejas is teaching in uh, Norway, if I am uh, correct. And uh, the, for his former partners uh, continue to do what they do as uh, Laboratorio Arquitectura y Paisaje. So, the, but the reason I'm showing you this project is uh, how, because how, uh, interesting it is to look at a particular design competition which um, demonstrates a range of uh, um, projects from uh, a more conservative spectrum or, or you would say a more implementable spectrum 
to a more radical spectrum. In the case of uh, an urban river like this one, uh, their proposal is more about re-engaging with the river, redesigning, particularly critical, redesigning the uh, section of the river so that people get close to water. Uh, in a way, the renaturalization of the river, right? And then the, uh, the one of the other finalist projects, uh, the one done by Latitude, uh, another firm, it was much more about uh, let's do what we do above the uh, maximum elevation of the river channel, right? They had a much more, uh, let's say, implementable approach to the opportunity of thinking about uh, the river as a, as a structural element, an even more structural element for the city. So these two projects are confronted as finalist projects. These were not, not the only uh, finalist projects, but these are the ones that I chose to select to sort of uh, uh, have this conversation about how important it is to think about the role of uh, design competitions uh, to ask uh, very critical questions for uh, opposing uh, ends in the spectrum. You are probably now wondering which one won, but of course the one that won was the one that was more implementable, more conservative in its approach, uh, less intrusive to the uh, certainly complicated condition of reworking the, the river channel section. Uh, it's, it, I think it's also a fantastic project, just like the other one. Right? It's just that um, the understanding of the particular problem um, being juried by the uh, Colombian system, which was proven to be, uh, has be been for a number of years, a very efficient and uh, credible uh, evaluation system to identify the best ideas. Uh, they decided on a more implementable approach, which I think is totally fair. It's also important to comment on, on the uh, capacity of uh, design competitions. Uh, look at these guys, you know, they, they are in their 20s, all of them, right? A project uh, with, uh, if I remember correctly, the, the winning prize was the, the uh, contract to develop the project, which was over a million dollars uh, in, in Latin America. It's, that's a lot of money. It's a lot of money here. It's even more money in Latin America, right, to develop a project. And, uh, and even the mayor is, is, is commenting on the uh, uh, award event that uh, the prize confirms our trust in our universities, our professors and professionals in engineering, architecture, et cetera, right? Uh, the fact that uh, the, uh, the team leaders, uh, Sebastian Monsalve and Juan David Hoyos, you can see them here, put together a project with their students, right? Um, um, uh, and the students were working on the project to see if something happened out of the project and winning the project. I think it's just a normal demonstration of, of this uh, capacity of uh, the uh, public open design competition to foster, to develop ideas. Um, so the project is built in its first phase. Uh, it's unclear if it's going to have, for now, a certain future because there's a, there was a political change, there's a new mayor, and uh, things change, right? Which is going to be also something that I will be commenting throughout my presentation. The role of politics in deciding, uh, particularly in the case of landscape architectural projects, which require, require a long-term thinking. Uh, trees need time to grow, uh, landscapes need time to establish, right? And, uh, and I just want to point out that the differences between the other project and this one regarding the engagement with the river uh, which is fairly simple in the winning project. Right? Another project that I have been looking at is the Mapocho 42K project uh, in Santiago de Chile, in Chile. Uh, this is uh, particularly interesting in, in the context of my interest uh, to think about um, what we do in the university uh, to have a, uh, in its, and its capacity for impact in the real world. The Mapocho 42 project uh, emerged in a studio, right? A faculty member from the Catholic University of, of Santiago of Chile uh, started to develop a series of studios looking at 42 kilometers or 26 miles of the um, Mapocho River as it cut through a Santiago's metropolitan uh, area. And uh, the project was uh, uh, repeated through a number of iterations in studios, eventually was taken over by a other faculty members. It eventually uh, had the ability to obtain public funding for its implementation. Uh, they established a foundation to ensure the implementation regardless of political timing. And uh, it's now being implemented um, 
it is a fantastic project uh, in this context of the ability to have projects uh, develop uh, because of what we do when learning and teaching uh, in our studios. And it's also a particularly important project in the context of understanding how to implement a project that cuts through a dozen different municipalities uh, we, that all have different design standards, different regulations, right? Uh, so they identified that the way to get away with it was to uh, pretty much propose a limited set of specifications which was not regulated, right? So you cannot tell me to do the bike lane this way because I'm not proposing a bike lane, I'm proposing something similar. Sounds like the same, but it's not, right? <laughs> so legally, you cannot uh, require me to do that. I think it was a fantastic way. Uh, by the way, a, a kind of innovation which is common uh, for designers, right? Uh, there's always a way to get away uh, with it, right? Um, so the project is uh, very, very developed. Right now there are some pictures for you to see the, the very simple uh, number and range of elements which make up the project. And this is Andre Turriaga, the professor that was eventually uh, uh, the one that is leading the project, uh, leading the foundation, and uh, uh, this is when we had uh, the chance to tour this uh, section of the Mapocho 42 car under construction a couple of years ago. So, in this context, um, I want to propose three contemporary paradigms for uh, the hybridization and the implementation of landscape architectural projects in Latin America. One is the fact that there is uh, uh, an interest uh, um, and even a very strong interest in the planning of Latin American cities for towards an urban structure based on natural systems, a, a recovery, a reconciliation with this, right? The, the footprint, uh, the relationship between our cities and, uh, uh, for example, particular rivers and creeks, it's an obvious relationship, right? Many of the cities in Latin America and in the contemporary U.S. were founded following the uh, principles of the laws of the Indies, right? which were following principles of uh, Vitruvius regarding the foundation of towns, the relationship with water, the availability of people, resources, etc. So the footprint used to be there, the, the particularly more important than the footprint uh, in the relationship between natural systems and urban systems is the proportion, right? How prominent, how large were rivers and creeks uh, in their capacity to structure cities and how we have transformed uh, relationships which used to look like this, right? I also uh, often comment in, in Mexico and Latin America when I, when I have had the chance to lecture about the fact that it can happen. There is a lot of uh, skepticism uh, on projects that recover rivers, on projects that uh, recover creeks. Right? Um, there was and is a lot of skepticism for this in Medellin as well. Uh, it can happen. I, I live in a city which uh, enjoys this uh, fantastic uh, uh, structure, uh, particularly on the green belt where you can go and and swim in the river, uh, typically things that uh, in most places in the continent are things that your grandpa, your grandma tells you. Oh, we used to go to the river to swim, right? Now, how could you do that, right? It's, it's all polluted, but in some cities it isn't, right? So it can happen. Uh, it can even have a very significant footprint uh, embedded within uh, densities in the urban fabric. Unfortunately, uh, many cities in the continent, in Mexico, Latin America, display this kind of condition, right? The, the, uh, the, the idea of process of the 20th century, uh, rivers transformed into concrete channels. This is Hermosillo in Sonora. This is my hometown in Mexico, Chihuahua. Uh, even a couple of years ago in Chihuahua, it, it, even in this context when there seems to be an agreement, right? That yes, we should recover rivers. Yes, we should recover creeks. Yeah, we should reconcile uh, uh, with uh, our landscape, things like this are happening, right? Um, while in some other places like in Seoul, Korea, the opposite process is happening, right? Uh, one is going up, one is going down, right? Or not more than going down, it's, uh, it's kept as a picturesque uh, uh, marker of what used to be there in the Chengyo Yeong stream of uh, Seoul um, of uh, the Republic of Korea. So in this context, uh, the, uh, it's the very important thing that is going on is that urban planning and plans have been updated and incorporate new capacities and ideas. Um, 
Yesterday, in our uh, panel conversation, I, I briefly commented on this, but uh, the fact is that until the late 90s, and this, is, this diagram is specific to Mexico, but if we think about it as well, for example, with Colombia and its uh, uh, constitution uh, redone in the early 90s, it's very similar as well. So there was a very, very top-down approach to urban planning decisions. Nowadays, we are, I believe, somewhere here in which there is an acknowledgement of a new mode of governance, right? Um, uh, Colombia, Chile, uh, Mexico, uh, Brazil, many of the countries of uh, our continent have gone through relatively recent uh, uh, political uh, transformations, right? Uh, in the case of Mexico, uh, democracy was a simulation until year 2000. Um, uh, Colombia renewed its constitution in the early 90s, as I mentioned. Chile. Uh, had a coup in, in the early 70s, then had a dictatorship, and then democracy came back, right? Uh, Brazil, Argentina went through military dictatorships, right? So, uh, in other words, the, the change in the mode of governance is happening, uh, sometimes because uh, people at the top want to, and sometimes because you cannot just uh, contain it, right? Uh, people demand a new change in the mode of governance. Uh, but I believe that uh, we are really still stuck here, right? There's the, the, there's the, the leadership is still taking a lot of the decisions, although there is a base, uh, which is uh, uh, most of the times organized by uh, organized, uh, the organized society, you know, chambers of industry, commerce, services, universities, uh, research institutions, but not just yet a real representation of uh, every citizen, right, of uh, every community, which is what I would, uh, of course, be advocating for. So, in the context of uh, the updating of planning in Mexico, before there were only mayors, now uh, this uh, decentralization of planning has happened and it's pretty much uh, present in most medium to large cities. One of the things that has happened, which is critical, is the fact that it used to be, when everything was top-down, that urban plans were really only about mapping those with political and economic capital and those without, right? And those without were all of the areas shaded in green, right? Conservation, preservation, et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, why? Who, who, who knows? The you know, reality was just that it was a map, a cartography of uh, political and economic power. What's happening right now is that with the uh, improved uh, technical capacities of planning institutions, uh, there are new real studies uh, being done. For example, urban hazards plans, in this case, the city of Chihuahua again, which identifies areas prone for flooding, which everybody knew already that the, uh, where I live floods every time it rains too much, right? Uh, you don't need a map to know it, but you know, because it was not in the map, because it was not in the urban plan, developers were able to still uh, build uh, subdivisions within the floodplain, right? So this is changing, and I think it's, uh, it's demonstrating a need, uh, and in many cases a, a critical and urgent need to uh, transform the planning of the cities, right? As you can see, the approved uh, ur urban land use in, uh, here, uh, significant chunks of that are actually under the floodplain, right? and now it is part of the urban planning and regulations of the city. Also, many other urban plans have been updated to uh, propose uh, relatively innovative concepts, such as uh, restructuring the city around creeks and rivers. This is a, the new plan for Los Cabos in the Baja Peninsula, uh, which says things like this. Uh, the natural physical milieu is the main structural element of the city for its open space public space system. The urban structure proposal makes of drainage ways uh, integration uh, spaces between different sectors or districts while becoming transversal and longitudinal mobility axis. So this is the kind of opportunity that in my teaching I'm trying to tackle uh, through a series of applied design studios, um, which is one of the opportunities of engagement. Uh, uh, an opportunity of engagement uh, with communities uh, between us in academia, uh, us as professors and students with the real world. I have uh, been developing a series of studios in a number of uh, northern Mexican cities like uh, Chihuahua, Hermosillo, Saltillo, Los Cabos, Nogales, always looking at this relationship between 
the natural milieu and the uh, uh, urban milieu or the human milieu. Uh, one of the particularly critical aspects of what I do is the availability of water in uh, arid North America is particularly critical. Um, many of the cities are located in overexploited aquifers uh, or uh, in overexploited surface water uh, basins. And uh, the projects have uh, diversity in their approach, but uh, generally speaking, there are two things that, that put them together. One is how to employ water as the structural element, and the other one is how to engage with a specific social and uh, cultural uh, concerns. Uh, this is uh, one project we did for a, a river in my hometown as a social and environmental integrator, uh, a creek as a demonstration project in Los Cabos, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about two projects. One is uh, Green Corridor's plan for Hermosillo, Sonora. Um, this is the condition of a series of uh, drainage ways which are artificial, are uh, ditches done to uh, uh, take out uh, storm water from the city in the uh, Sonoran Desert. Um, as you can see, that's where trees grow on their own. No, no more maintenance needed. But these are also elements which are employed by people to complement or supplement their daily needs, mobility needs, uh, structural needs. Um, I typically, as was commented as well, I typically engage with, um, with local public institutions. I typically obtain grants, small grants typically. Th these public institutions don't have much money to develop the studies they need to, de to, to develop. But, uh, uh, it has been a, a very interesting tool to disseminate, first of all, um, landscape architectural concepts which are not present locally in many places in Latin America. There is, there is no landscape architecture program in Hermosillo, Chihuahua, you name it, right? Um, there is a landscape architecture project in, in Santiago, Chile, of course, right? maybe more than one, right? The, the Catholic University of, Ch of, of Chile has one. So we looked at the city through a diversity of scales, the city, basins and soft basins, local systems, site-specific opportunities. We also mapped the social milieu, uh, particularly interested on identifying uh, areas of more urgency, social urgency, lower income areas. We also contrasted the uh, existing plans, which in many ways are, are very well intended, but in many ways are also uh, unfortunately not enough uh, uh, they, they don't pay sufficient attention, in, in my opinion, to the real implementability of projects. For example, the existing plan of Hermosillo proposes uh, over 300 miles of redesigned streets to include bike lanes from nowhere, right? It's not like there were 100 miles already, no, no, there is zero, right? So um, I believe that this kind of uh, uh, intentionality opens up opportunities for the hybridization as well of, in this particular case, a sustainable mobility. What happens if we uh, reduce that idea of uh, uh, non-motorized mobility in Hermosillo and integrate it through a system of uh, recovered or regenerated uh, greenways, which uh, are much more strategic and tactical to provide a, at least an initial coverage uh, for this kind of mobility in the city, right? And the ideas are fairly simple in, in, in its implementation, right? From here to that, right? The, uh, the context of these kind of projects is also important to comment in its capacity and the role of the projects to not to be exactly implemented as produced in the studio, but really to facilitate, to to further the capacity to, to, to get projects closer to implementation. This is the planning director of Hermosillo presenting our project at the uh, Green Infrastructure Forum organized by the uh, uh, EPA in uh, Saltillo a couple of years ago. Another project, and this is the second one I'm going to show, uh, it's uh, uh, the one that we developed last semester. We produced a set of public space design guidelines for the city of Saltillo. Uh, once again, uh, uh, a similar uh, kind of engagement, uh, working with the mayor. Here the mayor is addressing uh, uh, our students. Uh, I typically try to collaborate as well with a local institution, not just because it's important to partner with a local institution, uh, not just because it's also important to partner with someone locally uh, to develop capacities as well, but also because 
if this kind of partnership doesn't happen because be between a local institution and an American institution, it won't be well seen, right? Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's something that uh, the mayors and our clients, the, the public planning institutions tell us. Well, uh, we want to do a project with you, but you have to partner with someone locally because if, if we say this American university is going to do a project for us, people won't like it, right? Um, so we visit, uh, we visit uh, public spaces, meet with those that administer and maintain projects. Uh, we go to construction sites. We uh, uh, decided on uh, an organization for the public space design guidelines, which is based on the life cycle of a public space, from analysis to partnering with who? With communities, with citizens, right? To design, to construction and maintenance. I'll just go through very quickly uh, on, through this document, uh, but you can see some sections of the analysis. Uh, pretty much a, a compendium and almost, uh, uh, you know, respectfully, uh, how to guide uh, for dummies, right? Like people with no uh, uh, background on landscape architectural methods and techniques, right? Uh, we also uh, produced a compendium of uh, uh, community engagement tools and methods. Uh, also, an organization of design into four basic systems, water, soil, vegetation, and culture. Um, an understanding of construction as a way to plan, enhance, and protect. And in all of this cycle, the incorporation of not just the contractor or the client, but also the community. And finally, of course, maintenance as a way to m maintain and, uh, and, uh, and care for uh, public spaces, right? As a colleague of mine uh, typically says, nothing is sustainable is not if it's not loved, right? So then eventually we uh, developed a series of demonstration projects uh, for different public space typologies, including uh, green corridors, and also uh, organized through the different five chapters, in this particular case, the opportunities for partnering with assets uh, along the greenways, right? Uh, in the case of larger public spaces, how to manage vegetation, how to engage with construction, with soils. And in the case of the everyday a neighborhood park or plaza, how to think about managing water, to establish uh, plants and trees, and the reflection of that on the vegetation system. And in post-industrial sites, which is a reality in northern Mexico, right? uh, the industrialized uh, region of northern Mexico uh, thinking about uh, the uh, post-industrial future, which is also a tangible reality, and what to do with the availability of these spaces, which are already being uh, abandoned right now uh, to a degree, and some are already being taken over as, as public space. So we produced uh, uh, this into uh, five booklets, which are being disseminated right now in the city of Saltillo. And then finally, um, the uh, third paradigm, the uh, uh, community and citizenship oriented practice, right? which is also happening. Um, unfortunately, not enough, but I believe that there is a growing, a very clear growing interest on, on responding to a new demand for a new, this new model of governance uh, in the region. Um, I'll show you a couple of projects that I have had the chance to develop in my own practice. The first one is a linear park um, in the city of Chihuahua, a one mile long park in a very, very low income neighborhood. Um, the, the client, the Planning Institute of Chihuahua, literally told us uh, we have a right of way which is 40 meters wide, 120 feet wide, one mile long, and uh, we want a park, a linear park. And, uh, and we, th we said, fantastic, but well, what's the program, right? Uh, you know, uh, there is no program, it's a linear park. Uh, and we were, okay. Uh, so <laughs> we, we visited uh, the, the place and we found out that this uh, corridor in a very low income neighborhood, which is a transit desert, a food desert, a public space desert, actually doubled up as public space already. And it also provided already, as you can see with the, those cars, with the uh, uh, weekend market, right? Every weekend, Saturdays and Sundays, uh, the people come in and, uh, and provide with, the, uh, uh, with what's missing, you know, in the urban uh, landscape. You know, they, they sell food, they sell clothes, they sell everything. Um, so 
we realized that there was there was much more to the to this corridor than than what the city thought about and uh, and uh, as this was also commented yesterday uh, within our contract we had no uh, component of a community engagement right uh, there was nothing that was demanding from us to engage with the community to ask them what they needed but we decided to to go ahead with it and um, and develop a series of community workshops to ask them, okay, so the city wants to do a park, what do you need, right? And uh, this is one of the projects, uh, as I also commented yesterday, in which we realized that, as you can see in pictures like this, that the most interested people on, on an opportunity like this were mostly moms with little kids, right? Um, and we uh, identified that the, the people were uh, more interested on public lighting, you know, it sounds great, uh, a park sounds great, but during the night, th there is not enough public lighting. The, the neighborhood is too dangerous. Um, I'm scared of going out during the night because gangs take over. Right? And, uh, we need public lighting. So we decided on a project which was structured around the idea of a, of a uh, light corridor during the night with community spaces, with uh, um, polyvalent capacities, uh, which were already going on there, as mentioned and with a series of uh, minimal, uh, uh, let's say, uh, gardening interventions, acknowledging the fact that being in, being in a peripheral location in a very low income neighborhood, there was little chance for continuous maintenance from the city, right? Uh, we decided on a project that would be able to uh, mitigate the issues of dust. Uh, the, the Chihuahuan Desert, uh, particularly in the spring, is very windy and in places with high uh, uh, presence of dust in urban settings, it, it volatilizes very easily and it creates public health issues, uh, including asthma, particularly with vulnerable populations. So we also thought about, of, about the corridor as an opportunity to mitigate the uh, dust problem by paving it uh, with uh, pervious uh, uh, materials, but also using that pervious material to collect water to help stabilize uh, the gardens over time. Uh, so the project was uh, shelved for a few years, and I thought all hope was lost. But uh, uh, last year, uh, uh, local administration picked it up and, uh, and uh, built the park. And uh, it has been performing uh, just as we uh, were wanting to see it perform. Uh, we kept the capacity of the uh, uh, weekend market, right? Uh, we uh, it was value engineered in a number of things. For example, we were proposing uh, a dozen of those canopies, which create community spaces. Eventually, it was value engineered to four, but that's okay, right? Uh, the important thing, in my opinion, is that um, it kept a, a, a social dynamic in place, right? And uh, it has been uh, performing uh, fantastically, in my opinion. For example, the idea of the landforms to harvest water, but also to have some grading to prevent vendors from jumping over the gardens is working. There are no vendors on the gardens, right? Uh, and, uh, and things like this happen, right? It's, uh, it, it was inaugurated in uh, November, October last year, so there's still a ways to go regarding the establishment of, of plant materials, but uh, I hope to photograph it again soon. Okay? Then another project, um, this one is more recent. Uh, it has been going on for a year and a half. Uh, and I already commented a little bit on this one uh, yesterday as well. Uh, I'm working as a general consultant for a, a public space and community recovery for no northern Mexico cities. This is a pilot project which is trying to intersect uh, three well-known approaches or methodologies. One is SEPTED or crime prevention through environmental design, which is a uh, an, an Anglo North American methodology, right, uh, regarding uh, public space. Uh, then also the concept of youth at risk, which is uh, an idea intended to prevent uh, uh, teenagers who are at risk of becoming gangsters, prevent them from becoming gangsters, right? Uh, identify youth at risk before it actually happens. And, uh, and gender based violence, which is a very, very critical problem. Uh, in all of the continent, right? Uh, but in the particular case of uh, northern Mexican cities, you know, we have uh, statistics which, demo which demonstrate that 
over 50% of women uh, as go through domestic violence in their lives, more than half of women. Uh, and we can, I can go on with this kind of violence. So, and the public spaces that we were looking at look like this, right? Very low quality public spaces. Um, I, I believe that not just Mexico, but Latin America, it doesn't really have that much of a problem, particularly in, uh, in subdivisions which were produced formally, and, you know, there was a plan, there was a, a permit given by the city to build 5,000 homes, uh, which is nowadays the most important mode of development in Latin America. In the 70s and the 60s, it used to be informal development, right? And all the way to the 80s. Uh, that kind of mode of development did not have an availability of public space. You know, there was no you know, plan which was, uh, in most cases, distributing public spaces, neighborhood parks and plazas in, in the uh, 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 chanty towns, favelas, uh, or the different ways to refer to this kind of organization. But in places like this, where there was a developer, there was a subsidy given to the developer, there was a permit, uh, there, is, there is not a problem of quantity of public space. The problem is a problem of quality, uh, because they are like that, right? They have not been able, in most cases, to be places which uh, integrate the communities, which are cared and loved by their communities. Uh, it also is reflected on, of course, on, on, uh, on different uh, degrees of abandonment uh, and economic capacity. Uh, in, in the case of Mexico, there was an overproduction of uh, subsidized low-income housing in the first 12 years of this century. Uh, Many of these subdivisions uh, occupy uh, uh, isolated, fragmented uh, uh, peripheries where crime is rampant and violence is rampant. So if you have overproduction and low quality of life, what has happened is, is a, a very high uh, level of uh, 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 housing abandonment, right? In some cases, over 50%. So this is what we were looking at. How do we uh, uh, find a way to uh, get these places be loved and be in, uh, integrative uh, places for communities in Chihuahua, for communities in this case of Guadalupe, which is a, a municipality within the Monterrey a metro area in the state of Nuevo Leon. Uh, once again, a very similar housing typology, right? Uh, subsidized, low income, uh, insufficient care in public spaces, uh, but sometimes uh, fantastic things happen, right? Like this. So. We, uh, we, we strategized and, and uh, uh, came with uh, not just a, a series of uh, actions, interventions, operations, which were both social and physical, which were both looking at public spaces, youth at risk, and gender-based violence, but also branding. You know, we have to have an image. Uh, the, uh, the logos were particularly interested on you know, getting traction in the communities. In the case of Monterrey, it's un paseo para todos, which means a, a promenade for everyone. And in the case of uh, Chihuahua, uh, my neighborhood is my, ha is my home uh, in Riveras, which is uh, the name of the, of the neighborhood. Riveras is uh, in Chihuahua City, up there. It's isolated from uh, the city. Uh, it's five kilometers away from the real, let's say, uh, uh, urban fabric of Chihuahua. It, there's a very inefficient public transportation system, uh, very high uh, rates of crime and violence, uh, high in unemployment, all of the social uh, indicators that you can think of. Uh, in the case of Guadalupe, the neighborhood selected was more, less, less, uh, fragmented, less fragmented, more within the city, but with a similar uh, situation regarding uh, social issues. They were different in scale, uh, the one in Chihuahua much larger, the one in Monterrey much smaller. Well, the first things that we did was to produce a uh, diagnostic of the condition, right? Uh, we, we employed different methodologies, uh, like walking with the community and the neighborhood, doing uh, community mappings, doing also a statistical uh, uh, collection to identify where crime happened, where, where uh, perception on, on insecurity was uh, present, and this was done by a series of uh, community workshops in both cities. This is the one, one of the ones that we did in uh, Guadalupe, in Monterrey. 
um, with the help of the, lo of the local government. Uh, this is the uh, teenager table um, in which we are trying to ask them what are the issues. Part of the project was also uh, training uh, to public officers. You know, this is what we're doing. This is why we're doing what we're doing. Um, these methodologies were, in most cases, uh, new to those that are in charge of actually implementing and, and, and being the uh, bridge between the local government and the community. So training happened. Uh, the, uh, the project also looked for uh, uh, social responsibility projects by asking for uh, the uh, capital, uh, the uh, socially oriented uh, companies and entrepreneurs to engage with the project to support a, a very wide uh, array of scales, which I will show you. Uh, demonstrated in maps like this, where there are little things going on, larger things going on. Um, one of which, um, one of the most important ones was to uh, recruit uh, schools of architecture uh, in these two cities to, to put their students and their faculty at work. You know, we need uh, capacities to redo a public space. Uh, we convinced one in each uh, city. Uh, and uh, in the case of Chihuahua, uh, with uh, donations from students and from faculty themselves, they produced an intervention like this one, which was a very simple approach, very low income, provide with shading, provide with seating, uh, designed not by us, not by uh, the team that I was leading, but by the, the specific faculty members and the students that were working with the community. They engaged with the community to work it, uh, to, get, uh, to build it together with recycled materials, and uh, uh, at least for a while, it seemed that everybody was happy, right? Um, we continue to be in these neighborhoods, um, and, uh, and, and I believe that we have had an impact so far, but the project is not yet done. In the case of Monterrey, uh, the strategizing on the different facing from the first interventions, looking at uh, the reconstruction of uh, uh, gateways to the neighborhood, uh, uh, the cleanup of uh, the main public spaces to more structural interventions which had to do with signage and uh, the improvement of sports facilities uh, till the end uh, uh, getting to a signature project in the reconstruction and the recovery of the main central public space. To me the most important thing about a project like this one is the uh, chance to operate as a designer uh, here. Uh, this is the, the uh, ecosystem map of the project in Chihuahua City. And uh, all of these are different institutions, uh, uh, universities, uh, 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 government uh, departments, uh, NGOs that were working together towards uh, the recovery of community and public space. We were organized uh, in coordination, youth at risk, um, uh, crime prevention through environmental design, uh, gender-based violence, and of course the community. We had a, a system of uh, uh, coordination which uh, established a, a hierarchy, but most importantly, I want to just play out the, the very important role uh, of the permanent uh, relationship with uh, community members that were organized and were recruited by the project uh, progressively, right? So this is, this is what I believe uh, can happen as well uh, when we we uh, 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 operate as designers uh, and planners in, in neighborhoods like this um, and in pretty much cities which are in need of better quality of public spaces. One of our most important objectives was to uh, institutionalize this and disseminate it into other neighborhoods. It is going on right now. This is, these are a number of uh, neighborhood managers appointed by the city that are going to disseminate the project in other neighborhoods. And we are right now in the phase of uh, systematizing the uh, experience to make it replicable in other cities. So finally, right? I have time? Right. Okay. So wrapping up the Americas, uh, making the Rio Grande and its watershed grand and brave again, right? Uh, and the Rio Grande in Mexico is known as the, as the Rio Bravo or, or the Brave River. Uh, I have been looking at this uh, project which is, has been around for a long time, has been around pretty much since, since the establishment of the border between the United States and Mexico. Uh, I have always found very interesting to, to look at this map, right, uh, published by The Economist. Wolf Mexico lives on 
and the, the mapping of uh, uh, Mexican origin population by county in percentage. And the, the thicker line is the, uh, the uh, uh, pre-1848 uh, boundary between the United States and Mexico. So uh, I have been looking at the border since, since I started teaching 20 years ago. Uh, this is a studio I did in collaboration with UNM, the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. We did a, a series of border studios when the border was this, right? You know, jumping on one side to Mexico, jumping on one side to the United States. And this is in the periphery of El Paso and Ciudad Juarez. Uh, border inhabitants living a few steps away from the uh, international border. Uh, this is the way the fence used to end in 2002, uh, uh, one kilometer away from El Paso and, and uh, uh, Ciudad Juarez, right? You can, you can see the tracks. Right? So it's, uh, it's fairly, I find it, you know, uh, having lived all my life uh, uh, in the region, I find it, uh, you know, uh, in some ways uh, appalling that the conversation is going on, going on the way it's going on right now. Um, you fellas need a job, right? Uh, this one is my favorite, right? Uh, uh, so the Rio Grande, Rio Bravo, what, what is it, right? I think it's an opportunity. Right? An opportunity that has gone through a, uh, cycles of booms and busts throughout, throughout our shared history. Uh, I published a small article a few months ago in the conversation, which was originally titled, Here's a, Here's a Better Vision for the U.S.-Mexico Border, Make the Rio Grande Grande Again. And then it eventually was picked uh, up by uh, uh, large and small uh, media outlets uh, who decided to re retitle it. Let's not build a border wall. Let's restore the Rio Grande instead. This is the worst title, Green in the Rio Grande. Uh, <laughs> uh, here's why a park is better. It's a better vision for the U.S.-Mexico border and a wall. Uh, I'm very happy that it has been disseminated locally in small border towns in, in, in the United States, including the Big Bend Gazette, right? Here's a better vision for the U.S.-Mexico border. Uh, and also uh, in uh, radio, uh, with uh, radio interviews in uh, Marfa Public Radio. Have you heard of Marfa, Texas, right? The Chinati Foundation. Uh, so this is the Rio Grande watershed, I believe. It, it has the capacity to uh, uh, produce a project with multiple scales, multiple government and governance models for a solution uh, uh, for the future of this shared environment. It includes nations, states, and most importantly, in my opinion, most effectively and feasibly, in my opinion, local governments, local communities, right? Uh, these, are the, these are the Mexican municipalities on, on the Mexican side, obviously, and counties on the American side. Uh, so there's the, the most significant precedent for this is, is something that is already going on and we need to be reminded of. Uh, there, there's a significant, the, the Rio Grande is a significant natural a critical uh, environmental uh, ecological asset of, that we share, right? It already hosts a series of national parks, wildlife, refuges, and other natural and protected areas, including most significantly uh, the cluster here uh, where the Big Bend in Texas exists and other national parks in the Mexican side uh, coincide. Uh, President Roosevelt and President uh, Manuel Avila Camacho uh, engaged in a conversation like this in which Roosevelt President Roosevelt mentioned that he didn't believe that the undertaking of the Big Bend was going to be complete unless there was reciprocity on the Mexican side. It eventually happened, right? Uh, more recently, uh, the previous Mexican president and the previous American president signed an agreement to understand this concentration of national parks as an area of binational interest because of uh, environmental and security concerns, right? Uh, so I won't read this, uh, but uh, things have happened, uh, have been going through this cycle. Here we have uh, the Ministry of the Interior and the Mexican Ministry of the Environment signing the agreement and planting minnows, an endangered uh, minnow species, a very small fish, right? Uh, this is the plan of, of this uh, uh, shared uh, uh, cluster of public spaces, right? Which is a good example, but it's not the only one. Right? The most obvious additional example would be the binational interest natural area of the Lower Rio Grande uh, River, uh, which is an, an incredible area, particularly 
uh, when thinking about ecological assets. One of the most critical bear, bat, and butterfly migration flyways in the continent, right? Uh, so, uh, including, of course, the monarch butterfly, right? So, how could this, this is already setting up opportunities like the uh, Lower Rio Grande Valley National Wildlife Refuge, which is scattered in a number of protected areas on the American side. I did a studio uh, one year ago on a border town in Tama between Tamaulipas and Texas, which was looking at energy opportunities. But eventually, we were also uh, very interested on replicating the availability and presence of uh, uh, natural protected areas on the Mexican side, which in this, in this part of, uh, of Mexico are absent if compared with the American side. But what's not absent is the engagement of, in this case, the uh, Mexican community of Ciudad Miguel Alemán having their most important uh, public gatherings, public fairs, right on the Rio Grande, right? Uh, so why not, right? It's already going on. Uh, it can, it can uh, uh, evolve from this in coordination with protected areas in the American side to additional protected areas on both sides of the border. And then finally, an idea which is directly related to green infrastructure and municipalities, which has to do with urban infrastructure. The opportunity for localized green infrastructure in the towns and cities of this region uh, it's already uh, sort of set up, uh, at least conceptually. The uh, EPA, through the Border Environment Cooperation Commission, has, has organized in the past, past a number of green infrastructure forums, which are intended to disseminate green infrastructure and the idea of green infrastructure throughout the border. Uh, there are things like the uh, international 10K races, uh, in which part of the race happens in Mexico, part of the race happens in the US. No, you don't stop to show your documents when you cross. You, 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 already, you already have a record, right? You, you are approved to run, right? Uh, local, local politicians are participating in things like that. The uh, governor-elect of Chihuahua, uh, Beto, uh, who's running for uh, the Senate right now for Texas, a, a challenger of, of uh, Teddy Cruz, right? Ted Cruz. Uh, the border makes America great, right? Um, so uh, projects which can be done in academia, like, uh, like an international island between El Paso and Juarez, uh, from a, an, a student from my time in Arizona. And of course, the obvious opportunity to transform this into that, right? Hopefully in the near future, so that when it drains to the creek, it drains to the border, okay? Thank you. If there are questions. I have a question. Yes. Um, I can't remember which um, one that you were talking about doing it from the point of view that it wasn't the plan that you did it in the community. Yes. Uh, how much time did you spend? In the community? Probably a series of workshops over a couple of months. A couple of months. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, we were already sacrificing our fee on doing what we did, right? So, uh, in other words, the, 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 the contract conditions were, in Mexico and in Latin America, contractual conditions are already sacrificed. Uh, design is not, is not well paid for, right? Which is why most, most architects and designers operate as design builders, right? What's innovative here in the United States, design build, in the Latin America is just a mode of operation, and it's the most common one, right? Because the sign doesn't pay enough, right? The construction pays better. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I believe that one of the things that hopefully will start to happen with this new uh, mode of governance, particularly because of the technical capacity of local planning institutes, is that they will start to pay for this kind of engagement, right? Because otherwise, it just really requires the, uh, the, uh, the uh, attitude right, of the designer to make it happen. Right? Yeah. Was this last project, what's the relationship that this project has with the government? It's, a, it's, a, it's an speculative project that I have been developing. Um, it's in its very early stages. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I am. Uh, this is where it stands. I, I started with a short piece 
uh, in a national outlet. It has attracted attention. It has a lot of clicks, right? Uh, I'm working on it to make it become uh, a, a, an article, or a longer article. And I'm also working on it so that eventually I can get some traction to get funding, particularly thinking about an engagement with a local government, ideally uh, a sister city condition, right? Like a small town on the border with, in Texas and a small town in the border in the Mexican state of Tamaulipas or Coahuila or Chihuahua, right? That's right now where it stands, right? Uh, but, but to be honest, I also think of it as, you know, uh, as a way to, you know, remind ourselves that uh, there, is, there is another conversation going on, right? There is another reality. The, 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 how the, the current political rhetoric has taken over this is incredible, in my opinion, right? And it's incredible, uh, particularly as well, when you, when you go to localities on the border, right? Uh, one, the border wall is already there, right? <laughs> you know. Two, the, 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 these connections between communities are very strong, right? Uh, and they have to do with uh, society, uh, uh, ecology, and economy, right? Uh, it, it's, a, it's something that I think we can make, uh, make it be part of the news, right? Of the, the local municipalities, local communities, um, being on board before kind of like cascading up um, to like, I don't know, federal agencies or whatever, it's kind of like yeah. grassroots um, movements and how important that is to get kind of something like this to get traction. Yeah, well, um, local governments, uh, mayors in Mexico and the United States are the ones that have the, 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 the task to respond to specific demands from, from their population, right? Uh, if you need, you know, a better, uh, you know, waste disposal service or, you know, uh, better parks, that's who you talk to, that's, that's who you go to demand, and that's with whom you participate, right? Um, in, in both in Mexico and in the United States, there are uh, differences. It's not an even condition. For example, in California, you will have a particular kind of engagement locally with the government, which is going to be different from that one in Arizona, right? Or in New Mexico or Texas, right? Um, the same thing happens in, in Mexico. There are places which have more of a culture of, of uh, communication and responsiveness between local governments and population. There are some places which have uh, a higher degree of, let's say, uh, 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 a culture uh, which, which is permeated by uh, classism and raci racism, right, uh, particularly, uh, both in the U.S. and Mexico, while I, there are other places where there are, that's not really pro uh, playing such a role, right, although it exists everywhere. Uh, so I think that the... Uh, uh, awareness of um, places that don't have enough of this uh, 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 culture of engagement with the local government is something that uh, has to be raised, um, uh, raised up, right, and uh, has to be disseminated. Uh, people have to be sometimes re reminded about about how they can uh, become active citizens uh, and uh, how they can organize and demand uh, action through collective action, right? Um, unfortunately, in the case of Mexico and Latin America, because of the political dynamics, the, uh, the, uh, the probably the most significant role related to green infrastructure, public space of local governments, has to do with the fact that local governments are in control of the public spending on public infrastructure. It's not so much the state government or the federal government. They do have a role, but that role is kind of for uh, higher, higher scaled projects like you know highways or you know uh, kind of a different kind of scale of economic development. Uh, of course, national interests and security, right? But local governments in in Mexico and Latin America are in control of the public budget to to build new streets, to build new parks, to to pay the police, uh, and that can change, right? Uh, there's there, there are many, uh, many uh, examples of that. Most importantly, in the case of uh, 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 Latin America, and I would say the Americas, the example set by Colombia, right? And the, 
what the transformations that they have achieved through uh, different kind of governance uh, uh, in almost every decision regarded related to public space, you know, even selecting the best designs, right? Um, uh, even if in the end what we see published uh, from Colombia and other Latin American uh, countries in the end are really more like demonstration projects because it's not uh, true. I don't think no one is claiming that, but the fact is that the projects that are published are, are isolated examples, right? But uh, because they have a, a, a deep impact in the collective mind, they have an, uh, much more than just a territorial or proximity impact in local communities. So I think that the, uh, uh, the constitutions of uh, the continent um, do empower, uh, to different degrees, but do empower uh, citizens to demand and organize themselves. The, the thing is that, as I commented at the beginning of my presentation, is that there is really a culture lingering uh, in local citizenship in which uh, there is not enough of a belief that you can actually have an impact, right? Uh, as I commented, Mexico became a democracy 18 years ago, right? Uh, even if it was simulated for 70 years before that. Uh, uh, Colombia uh, reenacted re a constitution in 1992 precisely to take uh, a power away from uh, the, the federal government and disseminate go uh, uh, government capacity to smaller communities, right? Uh, I already mentioned about Chile, Argentina, Brazil. So in other words, there isn't a culture of empowerment. A lot of people in, in the Americas do not realize that they can have an impact, right? And that's also demonstrated here in the US. Uh, you have uh, a lot of uh, immigrants from Latin America coming to the US, becoming citizens and not voting because in, it's not in your DNA that your vote is going to do something about it, right? It's, your vote is going to count, right? Because when I was in Brazil or Colombia or whatever in Mexico, my vote was a simulation, right? And democracy was enacted only because of electoral purposes, right? Right now, Mexico is going through its presidential election and uh, different political parties, different uh, 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 leaderships are doing what they know to do very well, which is giving away money, you know, to buy votes, right? You know, you know, but right now. Right? And then once the election happens, uh, the project that I presented, uh, 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 Recovering Public Space in Northern Mexican Cities, uh, the first set of projects, we call it trust projects, uh, Proyectos de Confianza. And uh, these projects are called like that because it's important to do something and do something quickly because people do not believe that you're actually going to do something. Right? People often tell you, oh yeah, the, go the, f the government came one year ago, said it was going to you know, recover this public park, nothing happened, right? And now you're here again, knocking on my door, asking me questions, you want me to fill up a questionnaire and, and you are asking me to go to community meetings. What's the point, right? So uh, one of our uh, tactics is to very rapidly produce something, right? Uh, uh, clean up of public spaces, uh, crosswalks being painted by, by Jews and teenagers, artistic murals, things that are easy but that very rapidly provide with an imprint, right? All towards the idea of empowerment, right? Uh, that yes, you can, you can do something if you, if you collaborate, right? You can do something if you engage, right? I don't know if I responded to your question, but <laughs> that's, yeah. that's going on. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.